My name is Dr. Alan Klein, and welcome to the Pericardial Center case presentations. We have two very exciting presentations by our fellow, uh, Radhi Zinaviv and Becca Baghdazi. Very interesting cases from the Pericardial Center. Of note, we're very excited this week. Uh, we had our Rhapsody trial um, presented at the American Heart Association and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Randy to talk about his first case, complicated pericarditis. You better hurry, hurry up with that treatment. Randy. Thank you, Dr. Klein, and uh, congratulations to the Rhapsody investigators. Uh, certainly a very interesting, groundbreaking trial. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, happy almost Thanksgiving. My name is Radhi Zinoviev. I'm a PGY4 cardiology fellow. And today I'm going to talk to you about complicated pericarditis. So in our agenda today, we're going to talk about an interesting case that we saw in clinic a couple of weeks ago. I'll talk to you about the generality of complicated pericarditis. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the imaging studies in complicated pericarditis. And then finally, uh, we'll talk about treatment. All right, so, so this is uh, Mr. C.F. He's a, a young 28-year-old male. He uh, presented with dyspnea and exertion since the age of 18. Uh, so he was actually seen at another center a couple of years before presenting here. At the time of initial presentation, he was found to be quite hypertensive, uh, 170s to 200 systolic. Uh, as he was started on antihypertensive treatment, given his early age and profound hypertension, uh, he underwent workup for secondary causes. And the initial workup was negative, including workup for pheochromocytoma, obstructive sleep apnea. His symptoms slightly improved after starting antihypertensives. Um, but over the first couple of years, he had uh, rising requirements in antihypertensives. And ultimately, he was diagnosed with a little syndrome in 2016. Uh, so because it's a, it's a pretty rare disease, I thought I'd spend a second talking about little syndrome. Uh, it's, a, it's a genetic disease. Uh, it's caused by an autosomal dominant epithelial sodium channel mutation. And you can see the ENAC channel uh, up here in this diagram. And essentially, the mutation prevents the degradation of this channel. This leads to excess reabsorption of sodium and the excretion of potassium. And because of that, patients get a very severe early hypertension uh, as we saw in our patient. And the treatment for, uh, for Little Syndrome is uh, drugs that act directly on this channel, uh, and the, the two that we have, amiloride and triamterine, uh, are very effective, along with a low-sodium diet. So after the diagnosis, Mr. CF has started on amiloride. His, uh, his hypertension improves, and initially he has an improvement in his symptoms. Uh, but in 2016, he suffers from a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, the symptoms last for a while, and he starts becoming concerned after months after the uh, initial URI. He's still having dyspnea on exertion. And now he's having some inspiratory chest pain. Uh, he feels that it's worse when he's lying down, improves when he's sitting up. Uh, he presents to a local, uh, to his PCP and is referred to a local cardiologist with the concern for pericarditis. Um, he has an echo, uh, TTE, that shows a, a normal uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and no valvular disease. So essentially no clear abnormalities on that uh, echocardiogram. Uh, and he also under, undergoes a stress test, uh, which shows no ischemia or scar. Finally, in 2017, he has a, a cardiac MRI, and this shows a small pericardial effusion, uh, interestingly, without any pericardial thickening or enhancement. And unfortunately, we don't have the inflammatory markers. This is, again, before he's referred to the pericardial center. Um, the studies are read as borderline findings for pericarditis, and he started on a prednisone taper and colchicine. And we'll talk in a minute about why that's potentially not the best initial treatment for this case. Uh, and despite this treatment, uh, he has no change in his symptoms. Uh, he has another MRI in 2018, 
which shows uh, no effusion. So remember, there was a small effusion on the last one. Uh, no pericardial thickening again. Uh, and this is the read. There are no findings to suggest pericarditis or constrictive pericarditis. And based on these findings, his colgicine is discontinued. His prednisone was uh, quickly tapered off. So finally, this year in 2020, he establishes care in the pericardial center. Um, this is prompted by, uh, again, with some worsening symptoms, uh, the fact that his local doctors are having a hard time exactly pinpointing what's, what's driving his, uh, his symptoms. Uh, when he presents here, um, we initially wanted to get an MRI, but unfortunately, his weight precluded, uh, precluded us from being able to get the scan. Uh, he was able to to get the serologies that are uh, listed here, uh, and his um, ultra-sensitive CRP was elevated to uh, 17. Uh, a couple of months earlier, it was five. His ESR is 41, also up from 24 a couple of months before that. Uh, we did get a, a transthoracic echocardiogram, uh, which shows uh, a now a very large pericardial effusion Initially, was read without tamponade, and we'll take a look at the images. Uh, so he's uh, admitted to the coronary CCU uh, and uh, started on prednisone, uh, colchicine, and NSAIDs. So here's uh, here's the transthoracic echocardiogram from October of 2020, uh, and so on the left hand side. Uh, you see the parasternal long axis views. On the right-hand side, it's the apical forechamber. Uh, and so the first and most striking thing that you'll notice is that uh, there's a large amount of fluid around his heart. And you can see this, uh, uh, the heart just uh, bouncing forward and backwards in, in this very large amount of fluid. Um, you can see the right ventricle here. Uh, I'm going to show you some uh, some other images in a second, um, but uh, it's uh, a little bit easier on the right hand side. You can see the the right atrium is uh, is really collapsing, uh, and then we'll we'll take a better look at the right ventricle. Uh, so this is M mode through the RV in the parasternal long axis views. You can see at the at the top. And you can see this early collapse of the RV, um, suggesting that there's a, a significant amount of pressure. And uh, here you see um, the, um, the pulse wave uh, through the mitral valve in this case. We, uh, we do have one for the tricuspid. We thought these were better images. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see the spirometry, uh, but I'll point here, uh, you can see uh, during um, inspiration and expiration, there's a significant amount of variability. I'm not going to get into the details, but this was very concerning for um, for tamponade. And so this is what really prompted the referral to the cardiac ICU for an urgent pericardiocentesis. Uh, so he, he goes to the ICU. He has a pericardiocentesis. Uh, there's over a liter of bloody fluid that's drained from his pericardium. Uh, the cultures that were sent from that analysis were negative, uh, again, uh, raising the concern that this is all coming from his pericarditis. So let's shift gears for a second and talk about complicated pericarditis. So what makes complicated pericarditis? Um, of the patients who present with acute pericarditis, about 1% to 2% will develop a pericardial effusion uh, with tamponade physiology. A second flavor of complication, recurrent or incessant pericarditis, occurs in about 15 to 30 percent of patients presenting with acute symptoms. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the immune system and how autoimmune ph physiology uh, can be at play in these patients presenting with recurrent or incessant pericarditis. Uh, but some early thoughts on this, uh, so patients who have recurrent um, or incessant symptoms uh, can be driven by an auto-inflammatory process. Uh, 
Uh, so this can occur either in a patient who has an immune system that has been primed, as might have been the case in our patient with his viral upper respiratory infection in 2016. In a patient with a persistent pathogen, somebody who's unable to clear the virus, or patients who eventually develop autoimmunity. And this is a graphic representation of what I was just talking about. So you can see in acute pericarditis, the complications can be either cardiac tamponade, which occurs in about 1% to 2% of patients, or um, patients with recurrent pericarditis, again, in about 15 to 30% of uh, patients, or myopericarditis, which occurs in about one-sixth of, uh, of patients. And so our patient had uh, several of these complications, as uh, you have seen. So what are the risks for complications? Um, there are a couple of things that can really predispose people to having these, uh, these complications. One of the first ones that I've highlighted here is the corticosteroid use. So you'll remember that our patient was first started on a prednisone taper. And there are a couple of reasons why this could be the case. One is that steroids are nonspecific and the effect on the immune system um, is not targeted as uh, we'll see some, some of the more effective treatments for pericarditis are. Uh, it could be because prednisone tends to be tapered off quickly. People are worried about the side effects. Uh, they try to get patients off as quickly as possible and at least to an initial response, but then a reactivation of symptoms later on. Not including colchicine initially can be a risk factor for, uh, for complications, um, as is a very high inflammatory marker on admission, so uh, elevated high sensitivity CRP, um, and um, an incomplete response to NSAIDs. Um, and, uh, and our patient, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have the inflammatory markers at the beginning, but we saw when he was presenting here, these were certainly elevated, and like I said, his uh, he was probably started on suboptimal treatment initially. And this is the, the first slide where we talked about the prednisone taper. So what should we do if somebody's presenting with concern for complicated pericarditis? Uh, so certainly serologies are key. Uh, this lets us uh, track patients' response. It lets us understand how profound the inflammation is when they present. And an Transthoracic echocardiogram should always be included in the initial workup. Um, this can, uh, can detect the pericardial effusion, as uh, was the case in our patient, and can certainly uh, guide management. Uh, one other imaging modality that can be extremely helpful is a cardiac MRI. Um, so this can be especially helpful in cases of equivocal, uh, recurrent, or incessant pericarditis. Uh, or in uh, patients in whom we're concerned about constriction. Uh, you'll remember that we tried to get an MRI for our patients, but unfortunately we're not able to because of uh, his weight. And this is a, a graphic representing what, uh, what I just talked about. Uh, so when patients first present, uh, an echocardiogram and inflammatory markers are very important. Uh, treatment with NSAIDs and colchicine uh, is the, the recommended first step. Uh, You'll note that prednisone and the steroids are really not, uh, uh, not as useful unless people are having multiple recurrences uh, through colchicine and NSAIDs through these first-line treatments. Uh, and you'll see that as patients have recurrent disease or concern for constrictive disease, some of these more complex imaging modalities like CMR become more helpful. Uh, again, the utility of a cardiac MRI, um, it, it would be very useful in patients who have indeterminate symptoms, uh, patients with prolonged or recurrent diseases we saw in our patient, uh, or in somebody in whom we're worried about constrictive pericarditis. The treatment I already mentioned, uh, NSAIDs have a 90% efficacy. Uh, we use these until the CRP is normalized and the symptoms resolve before we start to, to taper those off. Colchicine is particularly helpful in auto-inflammatory states, which we'll talk about in a minute. It decreases recurrence rates by up to 50%, um, and we treat for three months in acute or six months in recurrent cases. And I already alluded to this, but uh, uh, corticosteroids can be added in refractory cases, um, but unopposed use of steroids early on can prolong the course and increase our risk of recurrence. <clears throat> 
Now, recurrent uh, pericarditis, as likely our patient had, um, has a somewhat more complicated treatment. Uh, so you remember that he was on many of these therapies. He was on colchicine. He was at one point started on NSAIDs. He was on steroids without significant improvement. Um, and so we had to think about some, some of the more complicated um, or uh, higher level treatments for pericarditis. Um, one of those is azathioprine. So this is associated with stable remission in 50% of uh, patients after steroid discontinuation. There are some case reports of IVIG in patients with autoimmune recurrent pericarditis. Uh, we've certainly uh, had to refer some patients with severe disease for pericardiectomy. But some of the most interesting treatments are the ones that are directed to interleukin-1. Uh, and um, that gets us to our, our discussion of autoinflammatory syndromes. So there's... Uh, there's increased interest in the inflammatory uh, cascade that leads, that can lead to uh, recurrent pericarditis. And uh, that's shown on this slide over here. You'll see that in patients with recurrent disease, there could be an auto-inflammatory response that's driven by some of these inflammatory markers that tend to get upregulated and perhaps respond inappropriately and drive recurrent disease. And because a lot of these pathways converge in the IL-1 beta or IL-1 alpha uh, cytokines, targeting these molecules has presented a very interesting target for treatment. Um, so our patient was in fact started on anakinra for refractory idiopathic pericarditis after having had symptoms for upwards of four years, uh, continued on the ibuprofen, colgicine, and prednisone taper, and was seen in clinic last week and was finally feeling much better through the anakinra. His repeat labs, you remember his, uh, his CRP um, was close to 10, his ESR was about 40, um, have now normalized, and his repeat trans transthoracic echocardiogram showed only a small pericardial effusion. Um, so anakinra is a recombinant interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. Um, there was a, a small uh, randomized controlled trial done, I believe, in Italy uh, that showed reduced risk of symptom recurrence uh, in patients with recurrent pericarditis who were started on anakinra compared to placebo. And we certainly saw that happen in, in our patient. And of course, the most exciting new, uh, new therapy out there uh, Rolanacept, uh, this is an interleukin-1 cytokine trap, um, and it was just presented um, by the Rhapsody investigators, uh, phase three randomized withdrawal trial of Rolanacept versus placebo, which, as you can see on the graph to the right, showed significant reduction in symptom recurrence in patients who were continued on Rolanacept. Um, so perhaps if our patient was coming a year later, uh, he would have had a, a different treatment, but certainly uh, the anakinra seemed to help him. Uh, so in, uh, in conclusion, uh, complicated pericarditis can occur in up to one third of patients presenting with pericarditis. The diagnosis is based on symptoms, serology, and transthoracic echo. Uh, and a cardiac MRI can be helpful in patients with indeterminate symptoms. Uh, the initial therapy should be with NSAIDs and colchicine, uh, that's sufficient in most patients. However, uh, in patients with a refractory recurrent disease, thinking about interleukin-1-directed therapy uh, can, be, can be useful. So this is all the time I have. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk, and I'll open it to the, to the panel. Thanks, Randy, for an excellent presentation. So we have uh, a number of panelists uh, um, and a very interesting case. I'm going to go maybe left to right. Um, Start with uh, Dr. Christine Jealous. Uh, so, Christine, in this case, um, uh, we have a number of options when, when we see these complicated pericarditis. We have NSAIDs, culture theme. So, do you see in the future that uh, cardiologists are going to be more trained in biologics, like uh, like rheumatology or oncology? Uh, you think the these uh, IL-1 inhibitors are going to be coming into mainstream cardiology? Alan, I think it's a great point. Thank you, Roddy, for such a wonderful presentation and raising some of these issues. I think this case really shows how recalcitrant some of these 
uh, cases can be. And when we see these patients in clinic, right up front, we have to acknowledge the the difficulties that these patients have had over a number of years and prepare them that there is no quick, easy fix, but that I think now, as you've said, Alan, with the IL-1 targeted drugs, we have some new options that we can at least offer. I think in the old days, we were looking at perhaps years of treatment with recurrent relapses and long-term steroids. And now, while NSAIDs and colchicine form the base of our initial therapy, I think we're much quicker to bring in an IL-targeted agent um, if the patient fails that therapy, perhaps after one trial of steroids. But I, I wouldn't say we're now pursuing that long-term steroids, which was associated, of course, with so many side effects. So I think this is wonderful for our patients. And, and the graph that Ruddy showed really speaks to the fact that these are incredibly effective medications. We've never really seen anything like it, especially in this um, uh, pericardial sphere. And I think for patients, it's a real game changer and something we're so excited about. Okay. Thanks, Christine. Uh, I'm going to ask Alice, there is a surgeon uh, say in the pediatric uh, arena, um, uh, are we pushing uh, more for pericardiectomy? I, I can just tell you a little anecdote. I, I gave a grand rounds at Mayo Clinic maybe a few years ago. And I gave a, you know, a similar talk, and you know, I was uh, talking about IL-1 inhibitors and all the drugs, and uh, somebody put up their hand and says, you know, they come with um, recalcitrant pericardiectomy. We just do pericardiectomy. That's a, uh, and you can imagine, let's say, um, you know, a 35-year-old uh, young, young person that wants to exercise and maybe uh, wants to have a family and they don't want to be on these drugs. And um, is pericardiectomy um, a reasonable option? It's, it's definitely increasing at the clinic. Uh, any, any thoughts about that in these type patients? Yeah, I, I think with the, you know, this is a great presentation and it's, it really shows the, the importance of teams of teams to get the right uh, outcomes for the patients and understanding the science and working together. I do think that there is clearly a role for uh, pericardectomies, but it's not without its risks and its complications. But ultimately, there's going to be patients that are going to benefit greatly from it. Uh, but again, it's we have to work with a whole team of people from science. You see these new drugs that are coming out and the outcomes. And again, everything has to be personalized and directed uh, to each patient and understanding what's going to be best for them long term. Great, uh, Debbie. Um, as a as an MRI guru, um, um, a couple of things. Um, in this case, uh, the MRIs were done outside the clinic. You know, we have excellent MRI at the Cleveland Clinic with our pericarditis protocols. But in the community, um, how well is this uh, translated? Um, and, and as you know. Um, People read the articles and they start doing these MRIs and they come here and the insurance doesn't allow you to repeat it. And you look at the quality, um, it's not the best. So any, any thoughts how do we have to educate the people out there uh, how to do good MRIs for these uh, patients? Yeah, um, thanks so much. And again, uh, thank you for a fantastic presentation and congratulations again, Alan, for an amazing uh, Rolanisip trial. So I think with cardiac MRI, um, it can be extremely helpful, but as you mentioned, there are um, some caveats, and I think in this particular patient, you had mentioned that he was significantly um, overweight. And even in patients who are able to fit into the CMR scanner, there's quite a bit of artifact that can occur for these patients, and many times they can't hold their breath very well. Um, and this can really degrade the, um, the quality of the cardiac MR. Um, in terms of the specialized protocols, um, here at the Cleveland Clinic, we do a fat suppressed uh, um, delayed enhancement sequence, and we think it's because the epicardial fat can um, appear bright on those images and sometimes can obscure the uh, delayed enhancement that can be seen that um, is what we see as inflammation in the pericardium. So potentially in this patient, he may have had a significant amount of epicardial fat that they weren't able to delineate fat from infl uh, true inflammation. Um, it's kind of difficult for us to say since we don't have the actual images. Um, but definitely, just like with ECHO, you have to have a very well-trained tech um, who will get very precise images um, and uh, is very meticulous. And I think for cardiac MR, all the more because um, there can be very difficult challenges with breath holding and gating. 
um, which can be very difficult. So yes, I, def I definitely think that going to a, um, a center that does a lot of dedicated cardiac MR can be helpful. Um, there are definitely communities out there that are doing fantastic CMRs, but I think in patients like this where the clinical scenario and the reading do don't quite match up, I think it's always helpful to get for, go for a second opinion and go to a center of excellence to see if um, further evaluation can be made. So, Ronnie, that was an excellent presentation, but, <clears throat> but um, you, you showed about that, that echo. So that was one of the um, largest amount of pericardial effusion known to man. And um, I remember the scenario that um, I got a call from the MRI suite that the uh, gentleman didn't fit in the scanner. Uh, so I said, okay, you know, uh, back and forth. And then the next thing I get a staff call from the uh, sonographer, come quick, this, guy, this guy's in Tampa Nat. So, um, Randy, so have you, have you done some taps? Have you, uh, do you have any experience with uh, uh, synthesis? But this guy, even a fellow could tap this uh, blindly without uh, ultrasound guided. But um, what are some of your experience with uh, tapping or approaches or the uh, uh, experience with it? So uh, I've been I've been very fortunate at the Cleveland Clinic in being able to do a lot of procedures, but unfortunately, a pericardial synthesis has not yet been one of them. Uh, this would have been a, a wonderful opportunity, but uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in clinic that day. Uh, but I look forward to being able to help some patients with this condition. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Zhu and Dr. Grimm in the audience. Um, uh, Rick, you just did a recent synthesis and a uh, chylus effusion, but any, uh, any uh, words of... Um, this was a very, very large effusion. Any uh, any thoughts about approaches or um, um, guidance? Uh, guidance? Thanks, thanks, Alan. Um, well, again, nice, nice presentation. Uh, massive effusion there. Uh, th this would have been a pretty, pretty straightforward pericardial synthesis. Fortunately, I, I would think. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I think uh, you know cases like this are pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, Obviously, uh, those that are uh, less clear in terms of uh, smaller effusions can be a challenge for us in terms of even to determine whether it's uh, necessary to to obtain fluid, drain drain the fluid. In this case, again, pretty pretty straightforward. Um, certainly, uh, making a determination as to whether true tamponade physiology is present. Is, is a critical issue. And uh, again, this was pretty straightforward. However, in many, many cases, most cases, uh, it's a matter of trying to determine physiologically, are they truly in a uh, critical state where they need to be drained and drained uh, urgently? Uh, that's that's often the challenge. So, uh, uh, yeah. Bo, I'd like to ask you one question. Uh, you, do, you do CT uh, and um, for some of the post-op uh, effusions, um, Dr. Phillips may um, do surgery, and there's a post-op effusion, and the it comes to the echo lab, um, and uh, it may be loculated. Do you see a role for uh, CT-guided um, uh, taps? Um, is that the future, or, or echo-guided uh, will be the uh, the mainstay? Thank you. That's an excellent question. There certainly it's uh, applicable in certain patients. I would say that. Uh, in a, in a proportion of our patients who have, as you say, loculated pericardial effusions or uh, often posteriorly located effusions that are thought to be significant, and yet at the same time when we assess by transvascular echocardiography, the uh, uh, standard imaging windows may not be optimal for safe percutaneous approach and drainage. In those situations, I would say and there may be a role for CT-guided pericardial synthesis. However, as the Dr. Grimm alluded to, a lot of the situation, one has to really make the determination as to whether the patient uh, is currently in tamponade or not. If, if the patient was really in a hemodynamically impaired state, then uh, you'd have to make a really critical decision and drain the patient there. Because uh, usually CT-guided pericardial synthesis would require, obviously, hemodynamic stability. I would not say that CT-guided uh, pericardial uh, drainage would replace echo. I think uh, echo-guided uh, clinical drainage will remain the uh, mainstay of our uh, drainage. However, I think there's certainly a complementary role there in these patients that are difficult. Okay, terrific. Well, we thank the uh, presenter already. A beautiful presentation and the panelists. We're going to change up to Becca. Uh, he's going to um, uh, 
talk about a very interesting case.